Well, let's start from today. We have virtual worlds like Second Life. It's flat. It's on the little screen over here. It's kind of cartoon-like. Despite that, the fact that it's not very realistic yet, uh, we see harbingers of everything we do in real life, from runs on banks to virtual romances to virtual concerts and all kinds of uh, activities that we do in real life. And in fact, for people who've been on Second Life just for the past year, they've seen a substantial increase in the realism of, uh, of, of that virtual world. Uh, the next step is we're going to put it in our eyeglasses. Uh, it'll beam images right to our retina and put us in a three-dimensional full immersion visual auditory environment. So rather than being here, it'll be three-dimensional and it won't be three-dimensional out there. We'll be in this three-dimensional environment and we'll be able to walk around and we'll like, feel like we have We'll be able to look at ourselves, but we wouldn't necessarily have the same body that we have in real reality. And uh, it'll become more and more realistic. Go out 10 years, it's going to be you know, just about as realistic as real reality. Still not within the nervous system. Go out 20 years, 25 years, these nanobots, these blood cell sized devices, will be going in our bodies, keeping us healthy from inside. Uh, we'll have some go inside our brains through the capillaries, non invasively. They'll be interacting with our biological neurons, they'll extend our memory, our decision-making faculties, they'll put our brains on the internet, and they'll also enable us to enter a virtual reality environment from within the nervous system. So if I want to go in a virtual reality environment, the nanobots will shut down the signals coming from my real eyes and my real skin and create the signals that would be appropriate for the virtual environment, and then it'll feel like I'm in that environment. And I'll have a virtual body in, those, in that environment. It could be the same body I have in real reality, or it could be a different body. Uh, a couple could become each other, uh, experience a relationship from the other's perspective. A teacher could assign a student to become Ben Franklin in a virtual constitutional congress, not just dress up as him, but become that character. And these virtual environments will be like websites. You'll have millions to choose from, and some will be recreations of beautiful earthly environments like the Taj Mahal or a Mediterranean beach. Some will be fantastic imaginary environments that couldn't exist on Earth. And, and these are not just uh, sort of places to play, although we'll do that as well. Th these will be places to interact with other people. Uh, and it will be an extension of real reality, just as Second Life is today. I mean, for some people, it's a game. For some people, it's quite serious. It's a place to be. And this place to be, a virtual reality, will become more and more realistic, more and more full immersion, more and more detailed, and more and more imaginative. I think uh, IBM's involvement with the game of Jeopardy is just one more example among many of the intelligent things that computers can do. Uh, I predicted in the 80s that a computer would beat the world chess champion by 19. 98. It happened in 1997. Uh, that seemed ridiculous when they made the prediction. As soon as it happened, people dismissed it. Oh, well, chess is not such a big deal after all, but computers will never play Go because that really requires intelligence. Well, now computers can beat masters at Go, and we don't think that's such a big deal. There's actually hundreds of intelligent things that computers can do, and they're not all games. They're, in fact, part of our modern everyday infrastructure, uh, financial transactions, detecting credit card fraud, designing products, diagnosing electric cardiograms, guiding intelligent weapon systems, flying and landing airplanes. I mean, I could mention 100 applications that are part of everyday life where computers are doing things that used to require human intelligence. Now, this is, these are all examples of narrow AI, meaning it's some narrow task. But the narrowness is gradually getting broader, and it's being driven by exponential growth in our understanding of the human brain. And that's really the grand frontier now in being able to create intelligent machines, and we're making exponential progress in that.